Okay, we'll be spending the rest of tonight and uh, I think all of next week and probably a good part of the following week on this subpart F area. And it's really, uh, it's really something that I, I think uh, is on the one hand very involved in terms of the details, but it also is particularly important and if you understand the big picture of why it's there and what different provisions you're intending to get at, it will become, I think, much more intuitive as to how it works and how to apply it. And as you read the code sections and look at them a second time and a third time and a fourth time, it will become more meaningful to you because there is some overriding logic uh, to this. Now there's two aspects to this, subpart F and section 1248. Subpart F are your sections going from 951 to 965. And they deal, uh, they deal primarily with what we call deferral. In other words, during the life of an investment. 1248 deals with the termination of the investment at the time that you sell the shares in the company or you, or the company goes through a complete liquidation, something like that. So they work hand in hand uh, so that there's, uh, so in a sense, the full range of the life of an investment is, uh, is uh, uh, taken into account and nothing slips through the cracks, so to speak. Now, at the heart of subpart F and the reason for subpart F is the concern about deferral. So that means we want to make sure we have a firm understanding of what deferral is. Okay, assume a U.S. person takes a thousand of cash from his U.S. bank account where it's earning 10% and places that thousand dollars into a foreign corporation and that foreign corporation places that thousand dollars into a bank account uh, somewhere. And uh, for simplicity, assume there's no foreign income taxes, uh, just so we can focus on uh, the concept of deferral. Now, when a U.S. person takes a thousand dollars and capitalizes a foreign company, is there any tax consequence from that? Okay, there's not, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, why is there no tax consequence? Uh, what was that, Christine? Uh, well, actually, it's even more basic than that. What is money? Is money property? For this purpose, foreign currency is property. But are U.S. dollars property? I mean, what's your if you have a, a dollar? What's your basis in the dollar? Dollar, by definition. So, in a sense, if you're just putting money, U.S. currency that is, into a foreign corporation, just by definition. There's no gain or loss. There, uh, it's it's not property uh, uh, in a sense. If you have euros and you put those euros into a foreign corporation, now there may be a difference between the basis you have in that foreign currency, those euros, and the value. So uh, there are consequences to putting property where there could be a difference 
between basis and value into a foreign corporation. But with dollars, it just goes in and there's no taxable amount. Okay, so you can do that pretty freely. There's nothing that prevents you from taking your money and putting it into a foreign corporation. So let's say you've done that. And now you're earning a hundred of a hundred of interest inside that foreign corporation. There's no foreign tax. Remember we said in this environment that we live in, that we practice in, that we work in, that foreign corporation is a recognized juridical person different from you and me and the shareholder. When the shareholder directly earns a hundred of interest, you know, from the money in his U.S. bank account, he's taxed on that money, on that uh, income, that interest income. He pays 35. But now, merely by taking advantage of this fiction of the juridical person, we've transferred our thousand and we now do not pay any 35. And as we've talked about, a dividend is not an obligation of the, of the company to make. The company chooses, you know, through proper corporate actions. The company chooses whether it will pay a dividend, if ever. So, this is deferral. We have placed effectively assets that earn income into foreign corporate solution. There's, there's less tax in that foreign corporate solution than there is in the US. And we have a time benefit of money. A dollar paid tomorrow is less of an issue than paying that dollar today. So if I can put off my payment of that 35 to some time in the future, and especially if it's never, but if I can put off that 35 until some time in the future, time value of money means I earn more today on an overall basis because I own that company. Again, it's a different legal person, but I own it in terms of a real value sense. The value of that company rises 35, I'm sorry, by 100 each year. So I have the economic benefit of knowing that my asset is increasing in value, but I do not have taxation currently. That's the firm. And that's what Congress in 1962 was all worried about and said, let's do something. So under President Kennedy, we got subpart F in Section 1248. You got a lot of other idealistic things as well that maybe uh, you've read about in your history books. But this was, uh, this was one of his, uh, his babies. So, this is what economically deferral is. Uh, another way to look at this, it's really like an interest-free loan from the government, which again, maybe you don't even have to pay back, but uh, deferral is like an interest-free loan, economically. Oh, another uh, interesting point uh, in 1962, when this was passed, we weren't looking at, for example, an individual tax rate of 35%. It was more like uh, the highest marginal rate was 90%. So there was a lot more incentive than today to 
try to use gimmicks or mechanisms to uh, defer U.S. tax. Hope you uh, enjoy this. Uh, anyway, uh, so needless to say, there was a difference in, uh, uh, let's say, U.S. shareholder response before and after the 62 Act. Okay, so before the, the 62 Act, the result, if a, uh, if a person, you know, owned a foreign company, there was full deferral on whatever, uh, you know, whatever uh, that company earned. There was no mechanism for the shareholder to be, you know, hit on the head and taxed currently. And secondly, when the person sold the shares, they would be taxed at capital gain rates. Now, again, back then, ordinary rates were like 90%, capital gain rates, 25%. Does not take a genius to figure out that there's some benefit to earn income in a company overseas and then sell the shares or go through a complete liquidation of the company, which back then would give you capital gain treatment. So uh, some, uh, some real serious uh, motivation. Okay, now after the, uh, uh, the rev after this act, uh, of course, as a foreign company, there's no U.S. tax directly on the company, but there is current, current U.S. taxation of the shareholder for certain defined items of income. There was basically a compromise at that point between two groups. One group, which were most likely the, uh, you know, the companies that were, uh, or let's say primarily the companies that were benefiting from this, they wanted a continuation of full deferral. You had another camp that said, you know, this is silly that you have deferral for something that is so meaningless as uh, you know, a juridical person you can form at the drop of a hat and for a very, very low price. So this ended up being a compromise in the center, which was, okay, we will allow deferral to continue for legitimate business activities and we will require current U.S. taxation on the shareholder, in other words, no more deferral, for passive type income, and that's your foreign personal holding company income, and certain categories of active business, active business income that are seen to be easily movable or where there's uh, where you could have just as easily have earned those dollars back at home in the parent company in the U.S. So we'll be getting into the details of what was that compromise effectively. What are those items of uh, business income which are considered to be the kind which, gee, you could have earned them back home or, you know, you could have earned them in a, uh, a, a nicer fashion uh, with respect to the U.S. Treasury. Okay, so the first thing is, again, current U.S. tax on the shareholder, no deferral uh, for this tainted or tainted or uh, uh, tax haven income, uh, those are terms that you often hear used. 
And then the second thing was ordinary income instead of long-term capital gain to the extent of earnings and profits when you sell the shares of the company or when you, you, know, you do a complete liquidation of the company that would otherwise be long-term capital gain. And again, with a 90% tax rate versus a 25% capital gain rate, sorry, 90% ordinary income, 25% uh, long-term capital gain rate, uh, that was a rather major, uh, major issue. Uh, those rates I'm saying uh, uh, 90 and 25, those are individual rates. The corporate rates at the time were around 52% for ordinary income and 25% for long-term capital gain at the corporate level. Okay, so, you know, I, I think a good question is, are all U.S. shareholders crying about this? Well, yeah, I think they, uh, they do cry a lot. There's uh, a lot of belly aching about uh, the result of these rules and what a pain they are to apply, but are they really, uh, are they really preventing the uh, escape of tax revenues that, in a sense, you'd say, well, gee, that really is income that should be recognized currently in the United States? Uh, no, it's not all that effective because we see a lot of these situations, uh, for example, uh, during the first session we looked at some information on Cisco Systems. Uh, I've given you, I think, uh, some information on the website on uh, Google's, uh, the publicity regarding Google, regarding how they have, uh, they have uh, uh, done exactly uh, what the gentleman in the back uh, of the room was referring to uh, in terms of transferring uh, intangible assets outside the United States on a favorable basis and then, uh, and then earning a lot of income outside the United States. So a lot of companies have been getting around these things and have been doing it very successfully. But the rules, irrespective of the success of getting around them, are there and if you're going to be working for some of these companies, either as, a, as part of their in-house counsel and tax sections or working for major accounting firms or law firms, you know, <laughs> You're the ones who are helping them do this. So, you know, this is your career. On an overall basis, I, in looking around, I found uh, where uh, uh, they're saying that uh, roughly 75, there, at least in 2004, uh, which to you may seem like ancient, ancient history, uh, approximately 75,000 U.S. CF, uh, U.S. controlled CFCs reported accumulated earnings and profits of a trillion dollars. So this is not, you know, this is not a sign of a great deal of success of the, uh, you know, in a sense, the uh, subpart F regime. But again, irrespective of that, you still need to know it and understand it. There's been uh, a lot of, let's say, uh, fallout or consequences that, uh, in a sense, that uh, is caused by these defer these anti-deferral rules, these subpart F rules. And probably the biggest one is that it really encourages U.S. businesses that have this low tax income overseas to use those funds overseas and 
make more investments overseas rather than using the money back in the United States. Because, gee, if we use it in the United States, we'll get taxed. And if you're looking at a 35% rate uh, and you haven't paid much foreign tax on that, so there's very little deemed paid tax credit, then it is a real encouragement to conduct more business outside as opposed to inside the United States. So this is, in a sense, counterproductive to what uh, politically is a good thing to do, but uh, this is the system we have. Uh, an interesting question is that a lot of the complaints about subpar F, <clears throat> uh, a lot of the complaints, uh, especially whenever there's uh, whenever there's efforts to to tighten up subpar F, is the complaint that oh my God, this is going to hurt us competitively. We won't be able to compete with our competitors from other countries, many of whom do not tax their you know, domestic multinationals on overseas earnings. So for example, maybe a German company, if it has a branch in another country, the income of that branch uh, would not be taxable in Germany or if there's dividends from an overseas subsidiary, perhaps those dividends are not taxable when they come back to Germany. So U.S. multinationals say, you know, we don't have a level field. We're being hurt competitively. So you, you get to a, in a sense, a question of, well, uh, who are we competing against? Uh, in some cases, yes. Uh, maybe a U.S. company is going to have a subsidiary, let's say, in Brazil. And a German company is going to have a, a, you know, a subsidiary in Brazil. And maybe they're both manufacturing pencils. And yes, maybe the German company is at a competitive advantage because ultimately when dividends are paid back, there will be no tax in Germany. And if Brazil has given both companies a tax holiday or some kind of incentive to come manufacture pencils in Brazil, then the German company may be at a, an advantage because the U.S. company that owns the subsidiary in Brazil, it knows that someday it's going to have to pay tax of 35% on dividend distributions. So to the extent that subpart F comes in and is tighter and forces them to pay tax currently on those low tax earnings in Brazil, in a sense the U.S. Uh, multinational is worse off. So that might be a legitimate issue of competitiveness. But what, uh, yes, Peter? I was, I was just thinking, like, what if that was a global company that had operations in Germany? Could the U.S. company set up something in Brazil and then just send the dividends over to Germany? If they had operations in Europe or Germany? Okay, well, that's a, uh, that's a, good, uh, a good question. Let's, let's just draw a quick picture as to, uh, as to why that doesn't, in a sense, change anything. If you have, okay, U.S. at the top, it forms a company in Germany. The, the thing's not on. Oh, picky, picky. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, U.S. company at the top, it forms a, it has a German subsidiary, and it arranges for that German subsidiary to form a company in Brazil to make pencils. Okay, maybe the dividends 
that are paid from here to here are not taxable in uh, are not taxable in Germany, not taxable by Germany. But ultimately, at some point, when these earnings and profits in Germany are distributed to the U.S., then you have your U.S. tax. I mean, like, if, if there were active operations in Germany, they could just use that capital in Germany or Europe or something? Well, no, you're absolutely right. As long as they choose not to bring the money back home to the United States, they are able to continue the deferral. Absolutely. So yeah. under the current law, how long can they continue the deferral? Is there a limit? Well, I think longer than you and I will be alive. <laughs> okay, that's, I have my answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, the, right now, right now, uh, there is lobbying of President Obama and Congress to grant another, uh, in a sense, holiday to bring money back home and not have a tax at 35 percent, but have a tax at, you know, either zero or five or or some small number. Last time it was 5.25 percent in the, what, 2004-2005 period. Uh, yes, Glenn? Would uh, these payment of the dividend to Germany be subpart F to income to Germany such that Germany couldn't defer it and have to be paid up to the U.S. currently? Outstanding question. Outstanding question. And the answer is, there's actually, uh, uh, let's see, uh, today is January 27th, approximately a month and a half ago, uh, I would have had a different answer for you. Anybody remember what happened? I think it was December 10th. Was there a compromise between President Obama and the, uh, Are you about and the Republicans? You can roll, like, you know, use all of your exemption amount to your spouse. Yeah, well, the, uh, what I'm referring to is not, not so much that, although, yes, there are some parts of the new law that, uh, that affect, uh, affect, uh, uh, affect the details of the, uh, of the estate tax. But rather, remember, the estate tax was supposed to, uh, uh, was, uh, supposed to come back in full force in 2011, you know, the, real lottery of the century, so to speak, was whether you were a billionaire and would die during 2010. Uh, you know, for those of you interested in the tax, uh, estate tax uh, issues, this is a, uh, uh, you know, this was a real once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, there was a, uh, anyway, there was a, a, a compromise, an agreement between President Obama and the uh, Congressional and Senate Republicans, and they came up with a tax act in, uh, I think it was signed on December 10th, although I may be wrong on the day, and it covered a number of things. The estate tax, uh, what would happen next year uh, and for the following year. Uh, and a, an agreement for the continuation of the 15% uh, long-term capital gains rates and qualified dividends uh, taxable at 15%. Uh, it would not be 15% next year, uh, uh, I think even this year, right? Uh, I think for 2010-2011, I think is what the, uh, if I remember correctly, what the effective dates are for these. But there were a number of compromises, and one of those was exactly this, this issue, uh, which is a particular look-through rule and how it works. Uh, the look-through rule was supposed to sunset at the end of 2009, and now it will sunset at the end of 2011. Uh, this, if you want to look at it, it's uh, uh, section 954C6. 
954 C6. And what it, uh, what it does, it says that dividends, interest, royalties from a related CFC, you look through to what the company in Brazil did, and if the company in Brazil had non tax haven income, non you know, subpart F income, then the dividend or interest or royalty paid uh, by uh, uh, Brazil to uh, Germany would not be what's called foreign based company income. And as a result, no subpart F income as a result of the dividend. Unless B had so far, unless it was... Unless, B, yeah, the activities of B were creating uh, subpart F income. Now, in uh, this particular case of the, uh, the rule, let's say the rule does not get extended again, then, uh, uh, and we're talking about 2012, which is when the you know, as of uh, that time is when the, the cur this current C6 disappears. In that case, it would be subpart F income. And this is one of the reasons why the check the box rules are so important. If G is treated as a corporation and B is treated as a disregarded entity. There's no dividend. There's no dividend. And therefore, depending on what the activities uh, are, you normally construct things so that you hopefully do not have subpart F income arising when the earnings are distributed. Now again, remember this Disregarded entity is only for U.S. tax purposes. There's still a real legal entity, B. It goes through all the legal niceties to declare a dividend and pay that dividend to a different legal entity, a G. It's only for U.S. tax purposes that we pretend that the box around B does not exist and that the activities there are merely a division of G if we have a disregarded entity status for B. I have a question. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. It may sound silly, but... There's, there's only silly answers, not silly questions. So, let's say they, because we're dealing with money, but let's say they have a, they, with the money they bought it, and they're drilling oil, and they found a gigantic, I don't know, reserve of oil. In so, of course, they will get you know benefits of this, and they will get more income. What is the point of always having the income sitting? Well, okay, a, ex, no, that's an excellent question. It's not a silly question, because the whole point is that, gee, it's expensive and terrible to bring the money back to the United States and be taxed. So therefore, how do I use those funds outside the United States? How do I use those funds leaving them in corporate solution outside the United States and not be you know, hit on the head? So yes, that's a very, very important question and it's one that we'll spend a bit more time on when we eventually get to Section 956, which is investments in U.S. property. And we'll talk about what's included in there and what's not included in there from the standpoint that, yeah, companies need to use their money. They'll keep it over there as long as they have the ability to use it and if they, you know, have to bring it back, if the pain of the tax 
is smaller than the need to bring the money back, then of course they'll bring the money back. Right now, again, they're hoping there will be another one of these, you know, bring the money back home free. Uh, so that's likely going to prevent a lot of companies from distributing money for the next few years <laughs> until this happens again. They want to build up as much as they can for the next bite at the apple, so to speak. Uh, okay, uh, uh, this is probably a, a good stopping point. Uh, so uh, any, any other questions on this particular area uh, before we part company and uh, uh, you take a, you know, a little bit of a look uh, between now and uh, next week at some of these subpart F provisions. Uh, please remember that you know, inside here and of course also on the website, there's a, uh, a relatively detailed, uh, uh, detailed required preparation for class sessions. So, you know, please do look through those and hopefully do more than merely look through this <laughs> to see what you're not doing. So, uh, uh, with that, uh, with that encouragement in mind, uh, uh, we'll see you next week. So thank you. Good evening. Glad to see you. Uh, I think the last time when we finished up, uh, we had talked about the bottom part of this slide but we did not talk about the top part. And uh, previously what we talked about was competition between, say, a U.S. multinational that has an operation in Brazil and a German multinational that has, the, uh, let's say, a similar operation in Brazil. And we talked about the real competition in the sense that there can be. But what about the situation, uh, which is the first uh, point, where there's uh, two US-based uh, chair manufacturers, one that operates solely within the US, manufactures within the US, and sells both domestically and internationally its products and compare that with the U.S. multinational that has a lot of activities in a lot of places that chooses to put uh, its chair manufacturing, let's say, in Thailand. Now, we will, of course, for purposes of our discussion, ignore the fact that maybe uh, wage rates between the U.S. and Thailand are slightly different. Transportation costs uh, will be an issue. Uh, raw material sources, of course, can be an issue. So we'll just say all other things being equal. Let's just look at the at the tax issue of this being, uh, you know, of whether there's a, a difference, and are we being, in a sense, fair uh, from a competition standpoint to two companies that are manufacturing chairs. And again, is there an incentive to move the chair manufacturing overseas as opposed to having it uh, locally? Now, again, we're saying one uh, has no other activities, just manufacturers in Seattle. The other one uh, has a lot of activities and decides to uh, put the manufacturing in Thailand where they get an eight-year uh, tax holiday and have zero tax on their manufacturing income for eight years. So what happens in this case? Uh, if, if a company, if the, the Seattle company that's manufacturing here, uh, it's going to be taxable at the normal corporate rates on whatever 
income it has. So no surprises there. What about the other company? Now, we haven't gone into the details yet of subpart F. We'll be doing that as we go further on uh, tonight. But uh, the idea here is to try to understand the importance of deferral economically. This company that sets up its Thai subsidiary, manufactures in Thailand, has the same profit that the company in Seattle has, but there's no current taxation either in Thailand or in the United States. So that's one aspect of deferral, that the earnings can be left over there in Thailand, and we'll talk later again about, well, gee, what's the ability to use? I think, Ricardo, you brought this up last time. You know, what's the ability to use? What, what good is it they have a lot of money in Thailand? Well, uh, it can be used, and we'll talk about that. But this point that there's an interest-free loan, effectively, for the multinational based in the U.S. decides to manufacture in Thailand. Let's say this multinational that decides to manufacture in, uh, in Thailand, it has excess foreign tax credits from other activities that occur <coughs> in some high-tax country. So it has excess foreign tax credits. It can choose to bring the money back home from Thailand, money, uh, money that comes as dividends with no deemed paid tax credit because there's no taxes being paid in Thailand. So we have foreign source income from the dividends coming from uh, from uh, the Thai subsidiary. We have excess foreign tax credits from some other activity, and we have a cross-crediting. So this multinational is competitively and economically in a better position than the company which only manufactures chairs, doesn't have other activities that generate excess foreign tax credits. So this issue of competition, if you're talking about two domestic producers, uh, there might be, again, sort of an unfair advantage against the purely domestic uh, producer. There used to be, uh, going back many years, uh, there used to be a, a number of incentives. They were sequential because they they kept getting uh, uh, outlawed as being against the uh, general agreement on tariff and trade uh, uh, back uh, many years ago or later uh, when the World Trade Organization, uh, uh, when the uh, uh, when the GATT changed to the uh, World Trade Organization. Uh, these various rules, they were the DISC rules and the FIS rules and the Export Trade Corporation rules. Uh, these things were all pretty much uh, deemed to be illegal under these international organization rules. And as a result, finally, uh, they made their exit. Uh, but there was an attempt before to actually give a real benefit to American companies that manufactured in the United States and then export. But because of the way our tax system is and because of the way internationally tax systems are looked at, uh, we could never create something that was legal under international principles. Other countries do have methods which are legal because they rely on value-added tax systems, which do have something which is legal under international principles to uh, have, in a sense, lower taxation of products that are exported. We'll talk about this more in next uh, semester's class. Okay, again, as uh, the point of why subpart F and 1248 exist, 
it really is easy to move activities and assets, or let's say certain activities and certain assets, into foreign corporate solution, especially in countries that have relatively little taxation. So again, this is this is a uh, reason why we have the subpart F uh, regime. And I think after this, we start getting into a little bit more of uh, the specifics. Let's look at the basic mechanics. We have uh, an example of an individual that owns, let's say, all of a controlled foreign corporation. And we'll eventually talk about what the details are of you know, how you determine if a corporation, foreign corporation, is a controlled foreign corporation. Uh, but for now, let's just uh, assume this individual owns a foreign corporation and it is a controlled foreign corporation. And that corporation uh, earns certain activities which are defined as subpart F income. The terms that are commonly used are subpart F income or tainted income or tax haven income. You find those terms being used almost interchangeably. The only official word, so to speak, is subpart F income, which is defined in section 952A. So since the uh, individual, of course, wants the benefit of deferral, he does not voluntarily instruct as sole shareholder the company to pay dividends. So uh, what the subpart F mechanism does is to treat the individual as receiving a income inclusion which is economically like a dividend even though there is no dividend paid. And the amount is based on how much of this tainted income is earned by the CFC. So the mechanism again is attack the shareholder, not the CFC. And why do we attack the shareholder? Why does the system attack the shareholder? Why not attack the CFC itself? The shareholder is the person benefiting from it? Uh, well, he's benefiting from it, but uh, the CFC could be said to be benefiting as well from, in a sense, the income. So both are, you could say, are benefiting. Is there something more practical? The shareholder is subject to U.S. taxation on the corporation. Yeah, the shareholder, I would say it slightly differently. You're absolutely right, but the shareholder is within reach. The U.S. government can easily grab him, you know, can put him in jail if he doesn't uh, do what the U.S. government wants him to do. On the other hand, it's a little harder jurisdictionally to force the CFC to do something like file a tax return and make voluntary payment of tax. I mean, that's just physically more difficult, you know, within our sovereign country structures uh, legally that we have uh, around the world. So that mechanism makes sense, and we'll see it also, that same mechanism, when we get to uh, the PFIC rules, uh, for example, as well. Now, whether the corporation is, I'm sorry, whether the CFC is owned by an individual or by a U.S. corporation, the mechanisms are pretty much the same. You, the law attacks the U.S. corporate shareholder or the U.S. individual shareholder and forces them to include a defined amount uh, in their income and pay tax on it. 
Now, one difference, of course, where you have a corporate shareholder, there's a mechanism for the deemed paid credit, and that's your section 960, which essentially refers to the rules in section 902, which you, you know, hopefully know and love from uh, the last few uh, weeks. The last slide was focusing on, well, let me go back to the last slide for comparison purposes. This slide is focusing on tainted income, subpart F income, which is earned by the CFC, and is saying that the shareholder is going to be taxed on a current basis, no deferral, for the net income associated with those tainted, those tax haven activities, which we'll define in more detail later. On the other hand, this slide is looking not at the subpart F income, but rather is looking at all the earnings within that CFC. So what are we focusing on here? CFC has paid no dividends to the U.S. shareholder, but the, the subsidiary, the CFC, has in the current year inappropriately used its assets by making an investment in U.S. property. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, Ricardo's question last week was, well, you know, what good is it to have this money outside the U.S., uh, you know, uh, with uh, no current U.S. tax? In other words, you don't have subpart F income. You've, uh, you've been able to successfully achieve some deferral on uh, income that you've earned in the CFC. And Ricardo asked, well, gee, you have this hundred of earnings, or I think in this case, 90 of earnings and profits. You know, what good is it? Okay, so there are ways that you can use it, which, so to speak, are appropriate ways. And there are ways to use it which are inappropriate. And those are defined in 956C, which will talk about in more detail later on this evening. So if, uh, if the CFC uses the funds in some inappropriate way, for example, making a loan to the U.S. shareholder and assuming the loan is outstanding long enough, then that would be an inappropriate use. Okay, so what happens here? The U.S. rules are looking at this and saying that if there's a loan by the CFC to the shareholder, well, gee, isn't that economically like a distribution with respect to stock? Isn't that giving the shareholder the ability to use the funds? And if there had been an actual distribution, you know, a dividend out of earnings and profits, well, then, of course, the U.S. shareholder would have had the use of the funds. So what the rules do is say if, if there is use of those funds inappropriately in the United States, then we will say you no longer can have deferral it's economically like there's been a dividend, and we will force the U.S. shareholder to treat as a dividend the amount that has been inappropriately used in the United States. Now, the focus here is not on tax haven income. The focus here is on earnings and profits that were successfully earned inside the CFC 
and which were not tax haven income, where there was success in generating good deferral of tax. So uh, this 951A1B, as opposed to 951A1A, is when you look at your tax code, you'll see that A1A is the subpart F income. A1B is the earnings invested in U.S. properties. So they're, they're really about two different things but they both get ultimately to the same place. Taxation to the U.S. person and no taxation, no effect at all on the CFC itself. Uh, this slide uh, shows a U.S. corporate shareholder. Rules are exactly the same, except that, of course, there's no uh, uh, deemed paid tax credit if the shareholder is an individual. Okay, so let's give a little bit of introduction to the main categories of subpart F income. This uh, right now is some introductory remarks. We'll then go into some more detail later. There are three categories that we'll mention. One, this first one is foreign personal holding company income. The other two are foreign based company sales income and foreign based company services income. And again, the common characteristic for all three is easily movable assets or activities. As again, a simple example, a US company sets up a Bermuda subsidiary puts in some liquid assets and earns interest, dividends, capital gains. Foreign personal holding company income. There's a number of categories within the foreign personal holding company income which you may have looked at when you were looking at your uh, passive rules uh, within the foreign tax credit limitation for the passive category. You may have, uh, the definition of passive referred you to this uh, 954C, which is where foreign personal holding company income is, uh, is defined. Again, simple example. Manufacturing of widgets in the United States. And instead of selling directly to customers that are overseas, we set up a company in the middle to purchase and resell. Is it easy to do that, or is that pretty complicated to set up? Uh, you're shaking your head, uh, Ricardo. Uh, it's, easy it's easy to do. Okay, so, pardon? Yeah, yeah Bermuda uh, is not too difficult, and there's a number of other locations that are even easier. So, I mean, within a day or two, one could set this up with relatively minor amounts of effort and minor amounts of expense. Uh, you start invoicing the company in the middle instead of the customer and then arrange for somebody to do the invoicing from the subsidiary to the customer. It's very easy to put into effect. Uh, you could add substance to it uh, as opposed to making it all paper. For example, if you do in fact have some salespeople who are running around the world, you know, doing appropriate sales activity, you could make them employees of that Bermuda company and add real substance to this. But the existence of substance does not change the basic definitions 
which would say that uh, you know selling through a Bermuda company to customers in Europe where the goods are manufactured in the United States, no amount of substance inside that Bermuda subsidiary is going to change this result. A third one, of course, is foreign-based company services income. And Again, we have our Bermuda subsidiary. And there's a French client uh, that wants, the, uh, uh, wants a, super highway, a super highway constructed in France. So this kind of thing where, uh, let's say, services are being performed outside the country of the CFC, which is Bermuda. Services are performed outside of Bermuda, and they're performed in some way on behalf of a related person, which in this case is the parent company. So that's a typical example of foreign-based company services income. Uh, yes, uh, Michael. Why do large companies have so many subs? Why does a big company have 30 in the Cayman Islands when it's most likely not at all brick and mortar, it's all paper? Why do they need 30? Is that not tax reasons? Is that just more their own accounting reasons? Uh, I would. Same thing all through one that you could do through 30? Uh, I, would say, I would say this it's a variety of reasons that I've seen. Uh, a lot of times, uh, let's say internal politics within a large company will cause there to be separate companies established in one country, whether it's Cayman or whether it's a you know a, a real operating location. I mean, for example, maybe uh, uh, maybe a division of the company wants to set up a uh, an office in Singapore to. Uh, coordinate sales into Asia. Well, if you've got a, uh, a multinational with 10 different major product lines, each product line, the management of each product line operates pretty independently. And even though there may be tax reasons as to why it would be a good idea to combine them, and have them all within one Singapore company. Well, we find management choosing to set up their own subsidiary so that they, so to speak, control it and they don't have to worry about arguments with other, uh, other divisions. That's one aspect. Uh, another aspect, yeah, could be taxes in some cases. Uh, Another reason that we often see this is because of acquisitions. If one multinational, which, very, which is not uncommon, acquires another multinational, all of a sudden they have parallel uh, ownership, you know, uh, let's say organization charts, which all of a sudden come together, and it comes together at the top. But the chains of ownership that are going down are all separate. And it takes a lot of time and effort to rationalize these arrangements, country by country by country. It's not something that happens at the time of the acquisition under normal circumstances. So I would say there's three reasons. Uh, why you see multiple corporations uh, in one country? So, you know, different divisions wanting their own uh, their own uh, uh, controllable entity. Uh, secondly, maybe tax reasons occasionally, and thirdly, uh, uh, acquisitions. Uh, I should add there could also, of course, be legal reasons such as uh, 
licenses, there could be uh, legal liability concerns, one business versus another. So uh, there's obviously a fourth reason, which is legal necessity. Now, notice that these three that we've just mentioned, uh, foreign personal holding company income, uh, foreign-based company sales income, foreign-based company services income, these are truly applicable to all industries. They are general rules applicable to everybody and anybody. There are also some specific special rules dealing with certain industries. Uh, insurance, banking, finance, oil and gas. And if you're interested in those, I certainly suggest go ahead and you know look at some of those rules. Uh, they're easily available to you, but we won't cover them in class uh, because they are specialized in nature.